said, well, don't you believe in karma? Yeah, I believe in karma. I just got a free soda. <laughs> okay, let's get into this. Tell me who was wrong on this. I was coming in off the road the other day, and I stopped, and I got a soda at McDonald's. One dollar, eight cents. Okay? Pull up to the window, and the girl said, did you have the soda? Yes, I did. And she said, well, the guy in front of you paid for you. Now, I know how this is supposed to work. I'm supposed to pay for the people behind me. They pay for the people behind them, and somehow that makes us a better world somehow. Except I look in the rearview mirror, and I've got an SUV behind me with about eight kids. And I'm not paying 85 bucks for a soda. But she's in the window, and she can literally look down on me. She goes, well, the guy in front of you paid for you. I'm like, well, if I see him, I'll say thanks and left. And so I'm telling my wife about this. She said, well, you're supposed to pay for the people behind you. I know that. I'm not going to do that. She said, we can afford it. That's not the point. She said, well, don't you believe in karma? Yeah, I believe in karma. I just got a free soda. Good morning. It is Saturday, May the 27th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the Serenity Prayer and the Star Spangled Banner, we will have My Take, Target, The Rape of the Mind, No Free Lunch, Donald Trump, and I, the Jury, Mike from Mike Hammer and Mickey Spillane. All that and more when I come back. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Thank you, thank you. And now, there's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths by David Bonson. Virtue and Discipline As it turns out, our capitalist age is generally not an age of discipline. Far from it. Our society, in most respects, is a study in unbounded appetite. Our chief public health problem is obesity. Our foremost social pathologies result from an absence of sexual restraint and personal responsibility. Our popular culture, much of the time, is a diabolical mix of Babylonian decadence and Philistine vulgarity. And our public life is a gluttonous feast upon the flesh of the future. We use more than we need, spend more than we have, and borrow more than we can pay. For all of our immense wealth, we somehow manage to live far beyond our means. 
In fact, it is almost fair to say that we lack for nothing except discipline. Yuval Levin. No proponent of free enterprise can ever presume the sufficiency of the market in restraining carnal appetites. There are character traits that enable humans to flourish. Integrity, discipline, patience, humility, delayed gratification. And the absence of these character traits goes a long way towards undermining human flourishing. And that was There's No Free Lunch by David Bonson. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Who is the true conservative? He knows that the government has no rights. He is religious. He is patriotic and uses common sense. He makes judgments, refuses to speculate, speaks clearly and definitively, and is not afraid to say no. He's open-minded, asking why rather than why not. He is consistent, credible, and influential, not ashamed of his existence, unafraid to learn or correct his mistakes. He is a normal American. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. What are the true conservatives' suggested political priorities? Number one, the abolition of abortion throughout the land. Number two, make nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons obsolete. Number three, immediate decertification of all public employee unions. Four, the immediate assignment of criminal and civil liabilities to all government regulators. Number five, the immediate repeal of the so-called Patriot Act. Number six, the immediate repeal of all emergency dictator laws. Number seven, the reinstatement of writs of outlawry. Eight, government-sponsored recalls, ballot initiatives, and referendums. Nine, a flexible minimum wage. Ten, means-tested health care. Eleven, the immediate and permanent prohibition of investment banking by any office holder. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. What are the true conservative cultural priorities? Bring back hierarchy. Bring back the admiration of intelligence, morality, and beauty. Bring back single-income households, integration, parenting, the primacy of existence, certainty of knowledge, and universal rights and wrongs. Bring back principled behavior, masculinity, and femininity. Bring back Adam 12, John F. Kennedy, the gold standard, pre-HMO medical care, and non-profit news. Bring back civil service, the term stupid question, arguments and fights, the cultural influence of the church and the Boy Scouts. Bring back the influence of social organizations such as the Lions Club and the Rotary Club. Bring back bowling. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. So I'm listening to uh, Matt Walsh on the radio, and uh, he is—he's uh, talking about Target and uh, the apparently Target's the target of a boycott, uh, another boycott. And I've already stated the position on boycotts, but whatever, um, I'll say it again. To be a true conservative, if you're going to in a situation with Target or Bud Light or anybody else, if you decide you can't shop at Target, let's stick with Target anymore because it just so bothers you. It just so bothers you. So you're going to switch, say, to Walmart. That's still conservative. If, however, you're doing it because Matt Walsh on the radio tells you to do it uh, because somebody else uh, bullies and intimidates you into doing it because we have to, we have to take some kind of a stand or we, we have to create some kind of a movement, you're not being conservative. That's all there is to it. So... Now, uh, Matt Walsh is saying that uh, Target said that they're going to go ahead and uh, make some sort of modifications, take down their pride displays or, or whatever because of violence. Now, the immediate thing to say to do is to simply deny it. 
say there is no violence. There is no such thing. Target didn't come out with specifics. They just threw it out there because of violence. Now, Matt Walsh made a big mistake. Matt Walsh went ahead and said that uh, he tried to prove that Target was not the victim of violence. And so he said that there were apparently somebody, uh, news people, he didn't say which ones, went to Target and asked for specific details on the threats and Target couldn't produce them. And so on that basis, Matt Walsh concludes that there was no uh, violence. Uh, But it doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that there wasn't violence. It just proves that Target doesn't happen to have the evidence uh, handy that there was any uh, violence. Okay, You can't prove a negative. You can't prove something didn't happen. You can't prove something shouldn't happen. The way to work this is make them prove it. And the best way to do that in this particular case is when uh, Target comes out and says, well, we're, we're going to go ahead and take this down, but it's because of violence. Deny it. Say, no, it isn't. And leave it at that. Let them, the tar- Target, prove. Uh, another way is it says, no, it isn't. Say, there was no violence. There was no violence. And um, then let Target Prove that there was, because the burden of proof is on target. You make a claim like that, if you don't have proof to back it up, then it's an arbitrary claim. And if it's an arbitrary claim, we get to ignore it. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the rape of the mind. The loss of verifiable reality, delusion we may thus tentatively define as the loss of an independent verifiable reality, with a consequent relapse into a more primitive stage of awareness. Just as the young woman we spoke about earlier began to believe in and suffer from her headaches, so the man who sells his private fantasy first as a rumor and then as a factual truth gradually loses his awareness that his initial statements were, in fact, deceits. And his delusion becomes a kind of permanent petrification of his original primitive wishful thinking. There are several factors which promote deluded thinking. Retrogression and primitivization may occur as a result of physical disease, particularly diseases of the brain. And it is with this type of delusions that psychiatrists deal. Many brain diseases put out of operation the brain cortex, the organ which developed last in the evolutionary process and which makes us aware and controls our thinking. When this disturbance of function happens, genetically older types of brain functioning have to take over. Most of the causes of delusions are not purely organic, however. The same effect of regression may be produced by hypnosis and mass hypnosis, which, by dislocating the higher forms of alert consciousness, reduce the subject to the primitive stage of collective participation and of oneness experience. If awareness and reality confrontation become rigid and automatic, if man does not look for alert and repeated verifications of what he finds in the world, he may develop delusions, ideas not adapted to the reality situation. Apparently, the human being requires constant confrontation and verification with various aspects of reality if he is to remain alive and alert. When experience is petrified into dogma, the dogma itself stands in the way of new verification and of new truth. The delusion of a nation that calls itself the chosen country makes it harder for that nation to collaborate with other nations. How deeply involved the process of thought control is with the general formation of ideas in our time can be shown by the following experience. After the First World War, I made the acquaintance of a German philosopher dedicated to the idealistic philosophy of his country. Germany went through a creative phase. New ideas arose of fraternity and world peace. Germany, the defeated country, would show its spiritual power. During our vacations, we walked together toward the sunny mountains of Ticino and devoted our philosophical conversation to the eternal yearnings of mankind for harmony and friendship. We became friends and wrote to each other about our mutual work till the shadow of totalitarianism came over his country. At first he was skeptical, and even critical about Nazism. Our correspondence diminished, and when he gradually became Gleichestadtlet and a member of the party, 
The final mental cleavage followed. I never heard about him anymore. So many philosophers surrender their theoretical thinking under the impact of powerful mass emotions. The reason lies not only in anxiety and submissiveness. It is a much deeper emotional process. People want to speak the language of their country and fatherland. In order to breathe, they have to identify with the ideological cliches of their surroundings. Spirituality, they cannot stand alone. Stefan Zweig wrote during the First World War that this inner process of speaking, along with the chauvinistic voices around him, was experienced by him as a deep inner conflict. I did not have the will anymore to be just to the others. Mass Delusion It is interesting to note that the phenomenon of institutionalized mass delusion has so far received little scientific treatment, although the term is bandied about wherever the problems of political propaganda are discussed. But science has shied away from scrutinizing the collective mental aberration we call mass delusion when it is connected with present-day affairs. It is the historical examples, such as witchcraft and certain forms of mass hysteria, that have been examined in great detail. And that was Mass Delusion from the Rape of the Mind. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Stuart Varney's My Take. 2.30 as we speak. NASDAQ up 127, right? Now this. College enrollment is down. The fall has been dramatic. There are now 1,160,000 fewer undergraduates than there were just three years ago. I'm not surprised. It's expensive, the dropout rate remains high, and the mask and stay-at-home mandates during the pandemic were, shall we say, not that attractive. But I've got a different bone to pick. I think the college experience has been degraded. No, I'm not going to give you the usual, when I was young. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm simply saying that college today is not all that it should be. Start with this from Scott Galloway. He's a professor at NYU. Roll it. You should never be at home. That's what I tell young people. Home is for seven hours of sleep and that's it. The amount of time you spend at home is inversely correlated to your success professionally and romantically. You need to be out of the house. Did you hear that? Get out of the house for professional and romantic success. Yes, college is a place to meet people with whom you may have a romantic interest. Romance in college today? (laughs) Come on, let's just say it is discouraged. In some places, men are supposed to ask permission to hold hands. That's a pretty good way to kill the buzz, isn't it? And don't you dare express an opinion of your own. Unless it conforms to the groupthink that now dominates. You step out of line and you become one of Hillary's deplorables. The college experience should be one of free association and open debate. Develop your brain and your social skills by being on campus, engaging, discussing, and maybe meeting someone you love. Now I'm going to do the when I was a lad thing. 55 years ago, I spent my college years feverishly discussing politics, culture, race, sex, theater, movies, and anything else that came into our young heads, usually in the bar. No computers, no internet, fax, cell phones, cable TV, or metaverse. I think I learned at least as much about growing up as I did in the lectures, that the, in the, at least as much as I did in the lectures. That's the way it ought to be now, but it's not yet. Second hour of Varney. I'm just getting warmed up. (laughs) So anyways, uh, so that's uh, Stuart Varney's, but the whole thing with college, as I've said before, the thing he doesn't touch on, two things. First of all, if students are not going to school, what are they doing? You're, you, you come out of high school, vast majority of jobs that you're going to have to get are going to require some kind of a college degree, an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. So if you're not going to do that, what are you doing? Are you staying home? Are you going out and get, trying to get a job that doesn't require a bachelor's degree? Are there any of those jobs left? Don't know, because uh, Stuart Barney doesn't say. So the other thing is that he doesn't ad- address the root cause. The left, the Democrats love their root causes. Oh, well, we've got to find out the root cause. Well, the root cause of overpopulation in colleges is Keynesian economics and the gold standard, or not the gold standard, but the um, uh, minimum wage. Because of the minimum wage and because it's not flexible, it keeps going up and up and up and up. 
businesses have to justify paying a fry cook $15 an hour. Now they want it to be $17 to $20 an hour. Why? Just because they say so. How do you justify that? One of the ways that you justify that is, it with number one, with experience. Used to be that you could, they had something called a training wage. You could come in, get a job at less than the minimum wage until they got you trained. And then once you were trained, uh, say for after six months, then you would go ahead and get the full wage. No more because of the minimum wage. So now you have to have experience. And who from, coming out of high school has any experience? Very, very few. The other thing is then you have to have a bachelor's degree. And that's why people are going to school. That's why schools are overpopulated. Because you have to get the bachelor's degree in order to get the entry-level position. So the way to solve that problem, either make the, the uh, minimum wage flexible so that it drops in bad times and goes up in good times, or even better yet, do away with Keynesian economics and let's restore the gold standard then we don't have to worry about that. Then if you're going to school, it's because you want to do something, uh, because you want to become an academic. You want to become like that professor from NYU that um, good old Stuart Varney was advertising, if you will. But anyways, the bottom line is, um, if you want, if you really want some improvements in terms of college, get rid of the of uh, Keynesian economics Restore the gold standard. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now Donald Trump calls for a purge against these criminals in power. The Russia hoax was the most atrocious weaponization of our government in American history. As the Durham report makes clear, it was a crime like no other. Seven years ago, I ran for office taking on all of the corrupt forces who got rich, bleeding America dry. They got absolutely rich, so rich you wouldn't even believe it. Our agenda was a threat to the entire political establishment. In response, a group of unelected thugs in the senior ranks of our government working with crooked Hillary Clinton launched a coup attempt to try and sabotage our campaign, our presidency, our movement, and our country. Crooked Hillary and Crooked Joe Biden, you know, we switch names now. We call Hillary lovely Hillary and Crooked Joe because we've seen so much. And James Comey and Andrew McCabe, Barack Hussein Obama, all of them and all of the rest knew that it was a lie, a total lie. It was a scam. The entire time was all a big hoax, and they put our country through hell. The destruction the Russia hoax caused to America is almost incalculable. It subverted our democracy. It weaponized our law enforcement. It stoked global conflict, and it wrecked countless lives. It provided the pretext for the left's war on our freedom of speech, worst of all, the FBI and the DOJ, both very corrupt, have interfered in every election since 2016. And now they are interfering in the 2024 presidential election. Before your very eyes, there must be a reckoning. For better or worse, accountability for these crimes lies in the hands of the voters. The Durham report has made the stakes very clear. And now the choices are is either the deep state destroys America or we destroy the deep state. With your vote, we will remove this cancerous culture of corruption from our government, and we will purge these criminals from the halls of power once and for all. Our country is in serious trouble. We can't let this happen. Thank you very much. Coming in, House Oversight Chair James Comer. And that was uh, Donald Trump talking about purging the government of these criminals. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, uh, Chapter 2 of I, the Jury by Mickey Sp Spillane. Mickey Spillane was one of Ayn Rand's favorite authors. And uh, this is a uh, book about um, Mike Hammer. 
And so, so far in chapter one, Mike Hammer has discovered uh, with the police that one of his best friends has been murdered, rather brutally so. And so Mike Hammer is uh, in a race with the police to get to the murderer first. The police want to get to him to um, uh, give him their kind of justice, and Mike Hammer wants to give him his kind of justice. So uh, here it is, chapter two of I, the Jury. Chapter two. The office was locked when I got there. I kicked on the door a few times and Velda clicked the lock back. When she saw who it was, she said, Oh, it's you. What do you mean, oh, it's you? Surely you remember me, Mike Hammer, your boss? Pooh, you haven't been here in so long. I can't tell you from another bill collector. I closed the door and followed her into my sanctum sanctorum. She had million-dollar legs, that girl, and she didn't mind showing them off. For a secretary, she was an awful distraction. She kept her coal-black hair long in a pageboy cut and wore tight-fitting dresses that made me think of the curves in the Pennsylvania Highway every time I looked at her. I don't get the idea that she was easy, though. I've seen her give a few punks the brush off the hard way. When it came to quick action, she could whip off a shoe and crack a skull before you could bat an eye. Not only that, but she had a private ops ticket, and on occasions when she went out with me on a case, packed a flat thirty-two automatic, and she wasn't afraid to use it. In the three years she worked for me, I never made a pass at her. Not that I didn't want to, but it would be striking too close to home. Velda picked up her pad and sat down. I plunked myself in the old swivel chair, then swung around facing the window. Velda threw a thick packet on my desk. Here's all the information I could get on those that were at the party last night. I looked at her sharply. How did you know about Jack? Pat only called my home. Velda wrinkled that pretty face of hers up into a cute grin. Hey, you forget that I have an in with a few reporters. Tom Dugan from the Chronicle remembered that you and Jack had been good friends. He called here to see what he could get and wound up by giving me all the info he had. And I didn't have to sex him either. She put that in as an afterthought. Most of the gang at the party were listed in your files. Nothing sensational. I got a little data from Tom, who had more personal dealings with a few of them. Mostly character studies and some society reports. Evidently, they were people whom Jack had met in the past and liked. You've even spoken about several yourself. I tore open the package and glanced at a sheaf of photos. Who are these? Velda looked over my shoulder and pointed them out. Top one is Hal Kynes, a med student from a university upstate. He's about 23, tall, and looks like a crewman. At least that's the way he cuts his hair. She flipped the page over. These two are the Bellamy twins, aged 29, unmarried, in the market for husbands. Live off the fat of the land with dough their father left them. A half interest in some textile mills, someplace down south. Yeah, I cut in. I know them. Good lookers, but not very bright. I met them at Jack's place once, and again at a dinner party. She pointed to the next one, a newspaper shot of a middle-aged guy with a broken nose, George Kalecki. I knew him pretty well. In the Roaring Twenties, he was a bootlegger. He came out of the crash with a million dollars, paid up his income tax, and went society. He fooled a lot of people, but he didn't fool me. He still had his finger in a lot of games, just to keep in practice. Nothing you could pin on him, though. He kept a staff of lawyers on their toes to keep him clean, and they were doing a good job. What about him? I asked her. Yeah, you know more than I do. Hal Kynes is staying with him. They live about a mile above Myrna in Westchester. I nodded. I remembered Jack talking about him. He had met George through Hal. The kid had been a friend of George ever since the older man had met him through some mutual acquaintance. George was the guy that was putting him through college, but why? I wasn't sure. The next shot was one of Myrna, with a complete history of her that Jack had given me. Included was a medical record from the hospital when he had made her go cold turkey, which is dope addict talk for an all-out cure. They cut them off from the stuff completely. It either kills them or cures them. In Myrna's case, she made it. But she made Jack promise that he would never try to get any information from her about where she got the stuff. The way he fell for the girl, he was ready to do anything she asked. And so far as he was concerned... The matter was completely dropped. I flipped through the medical record. Name, 
Myrna Devlin. Attempted suicide while under the influence of heroin. Brought to emergency ward of General Hospital by Detective Jack Williams. Admitted 31540. Treatment complete 92140. No information available on patient's source of narcotics. Released into custody of Detective Jack Williams 93040. Following this was a page of medical details which I skipped. Here's one you like, chum. Velda grinned at me. She pulled out a full-length photo of a gorgeous blonde. My heart jumped when I saw it. The picture was taken at a beach, and she stood there tall and languid-looking in a white bathing suit. Long, solid legs. A little heavier than the movie experts consider good form, but the kind that make you drool to look at. Under the suit, I could see the muscles of her stomach. Incredibly wide shoulders for a woman, framing breasts that jutted out, seeking freedom from the restraining fabric of the suit. Her hair looked white in the picture, but I could tell that it was a natural blonde. Lovely, lovely yellow hair. But her face was what got me. I thought Velda was a good looker, but this one was even lovelier. I felt like whistling. Who is she? Uh, maybe I shouldn't tell you. That leer on your face could get you into trouble, but it's all there. Name's Charlotte Manning. She's a female psychiatrist with offices on Park Avenue and very successful. I understand she caters to a pretty ritzy clientele. I glanced at the number and made up my mind that right here was something that made this business a pleasurable one. I didn't say that to Velda. And maybe I'm being conceited, but I've always had the impression that she had designs on me. Of course, she never mentioned it, but whenever I showed up late in the office with lipstick on my shirt collar... I couldn't get two words out of her for a week. I stacked the sheaf back on my desk and swung around in the chair. Velda was leaning forward, ready to take notes. Want I add anything, Mike? Don't think so. At least not now. There's too much to think about first. Nothing seems to make sense. Well, what about motive? Could Jack have had any enemies that caught up with him? Nope. None I know of. He was square. He always gave a guy a break if he deserved it. Then, too, he never was wrapped up in anything big. Did he own anything of any importance? Not a thing. The place was completely untouched. He had a few hundred dollars in his wallet that was lying on the dresser. The killing was done by a sadist. He tried to reach his gun, but the killer pulled the chair it hung on, back slowly, making him crawl after it with a slug in his gut trying to keep his insides from falling out with his hand. Mike, please. I said no more. I just sat there and glowered at the wall. Someday, I'd trigger the bastard that shot Jack. In my time, I've done it plenty of times. No sentiment. That went out with the first. After the war, I've been almost anxious to get to some of the rats that make up the section of humanity that prey on people. People. How incredibly stupid they could be sometimes. A trial by law for a killer. A loophole in the phrasing that lets a killer crawl out. But in the end, the people have their justice. They get it through guys like me once in a while. They crack down on society, and I crack down on them. I shoot them like the mad dogs they are, and society drags me to court to explain the whys and wherefores of the extermination. They investigate my past check my fingerprints, and throw a million questions my way. The papers make me look like a kill-crazy Seamus, but they don't bear down too hard, because Pat Chambers keeps them off my neck. Besides, I do my best to help the boys out, and they know it. And I'm usually good for a story when I wind up a case. Velda came back into the office with the afternoon edition of the sheets. The kill was spread all over the front page, followed by a four-column layout of what details were available. Velda was reading over my shoulder, and I heard her gasp. Did you come in for a blastin'? Look! She was pointing to the last paragraph. There was my tie-up with the case, but what she was referring to was the word-for-word -word statement that I had made to Jack. My promise, my word to a dead friend that I would kill this murderer as he had killed him. I rolled the paper into a ball and threw it viciously at the wall. The louse! I'll break his filthy neck for printing that. I meant what I said when I made that promise. It's sacred to me, and they make a joke out of it. Pat did that, and I thought he was a friend. Give me the phone. Velda grabbed my arm. 
Take it easy. Suppose he did. After all, Pat's still a cop. Maybe he saw a chance of throwing the killer your way. If the punk knows you're after him for keeps, he's liable not to take it standing still and make a play for you. Then you'll have him. Thanks, kid, I told her. But your mind's too clean. I think you got the first part right. But your guess on the last part smells. Pat doesn't want me to have any part of him because he knows the case has ended right there. If he can get the killer to me, you can bet your grandmother's uplift bra that he'll have a tail on me all the way with someone ready to step in when the shooting starts. Oh, I don't know about that, Mike. Pat knows you're too smart not to recognize when you're being tailed. I wouldn't think he'd do that. Oh, no. He isn't dumb by any means. I'll bet you a sandwich against a marriage license. He's got a flat foot downstairs, covering every exit in the place, ready to pick me up when I leave. Sure, I'll shake them. But it won't stop there. A couple of experts will take up where they left off. Velda's eyes were glowing like a couple of hot brands. Are you serious about that? About the bet, I mean? I nodded. Dead serious. Want to go downstairs with me and take a look? She grinned and grabbed her coat. I put on my battered felt and we left the office. But not before I had taken a second glance at the office address of Charlotte Manning. Pete, the elevator operator, gave me a toothy grin when we stepped into the car. Evening, Mr. Hammer, he said. I gave him an easy jab in the short ribs and said, What's new with you? Mm, nothing much, except that I don't get to sit down much on the job anymore. I had to grin. Velda had lost the bet already. That little piece of simple repartee between Pete and myself was a code system we had rigged up years ago. His answer meant that I was going to have company when I left the building. It cost me a fin a week, but it was worth it. Pete could spot a flat foot faster than I can. He should. He'd been a pickpocket until a long stretch up the river gave him a turn of mind. For a change, I decided to use the front entrance. I looked around for my tail, but there was none to be seen. For a split second, my heart leaped into my throat. I was afraid Pete had gotten his signals crossed. Velda was a spotter, too, and the smile she was wearing as we crossed the empty lobby was a thing to see. She clamped onto my arm, ready to march me to the nearest justice of the peace. But when I went through the revolving doors, her grin passed as fast as mine appeared. Our tail was walking in front of us. Velda said a word that nice girls don't usually use, and you see scratched in the cement by some evil-minded gutter snipe. This one was smart. We never saw where he came from. He walked a lot faster than we did, swinging a newspaper from his hand against his leg. Probably, he spotted us through the windows, behind the palm, then seeing what exit we were going to use, walked around the corner, and came past us as we left. If we had gone the other way, undoubtedly there was another ready to pick us up. But this one had forgotten to take his gun off his hip and stow it under his shoulder, and guns make a bump look the size of a pumpkin when you're used to looking for them. When I reached the garage, he was nowhere to be seen. There were a lot of doors he could have ducked behind. I didn't waste time looking for him. I backed the car out and Velda crawled in beside me. Where to now? She asked. The automat, where you're going to buy me a sandwich. And that was Mickey Spillane's Mike Hammer in I, the Jury, Chapter 2. Back in a minute.
This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. So I'm reminding you that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.